I'm Jewish in origin. My dad's from Israel. My mom's from England. Before I was born, he opened his bakery, a Bible bakery, which is what you had to talk about. He opened it to the public in 1974. However, it was a wholesale business prior to that. He met my mum at the bakery. So she works for him. So they got together there. There's a part of London called Stanford, so it's a typically Jewish area. So I was born there, and that's where I went to school. When we were younger, my dad was probably a little bit more observant than he was later on in life, and that's due to his mum. His mum was religious. He didn't, my dad didn't really care. We were like, you know, traditional. We kept bits and pieces, but so we weren't like full on. We enjoyed ourselves as well. I went to a Jewish primary school. My children go to a public English school. So on Sundays, they have like an hour or two of Jewish school. I wouldn't say they start reading all the Bible and, and whatever. With Jewish people, they learn a little bit about our religion and the festivals. Because like I said, I'm not that religious. So I'm not hugely practicing. But it's nice to know. It's like education, isn't it? So we had normal, you know, maths, English, Jewish studies. We, we learned about Jewish stuff, kind of like religious studies, history, geography, you know, et cetera, et cetera, PE. You know, we did everything just within our school learning. We had a little Jewish education as part of it. And also it was a Jewish school with theme. So what does Jewish that mean? Because I come from a Muslim country and there are no Jews here. Very similar to being Muslim, actually. You've got halal over there. Yes. We've got kosher. It's the same thing, a different name. They've got like five prayer times a day. Yes. We have three. I don't do any, but we're meant to pray three times a day. Women shouldn't really be like walking around in bikinis and whatnot and showing their body off. Okay, yeah, we're a little bit more discreet as well. You know, it's very similar. So you mentioned that your father started his business before you were born. So I imagine that growing up, there must have been a tremendous feature in your family life. Yeah, like I would go there as a child all the time. He would take me there. It was like, it was a fun place to be when you're small, you know? Like, imagine being a child, there's, there's flour, dough, machinery. Like, you don't have to keep the place clean like you do at home. <laughs> Throw flour everywhere. And, you know, you clean up afterwards, obviously. We're not animals. I started working full-time at 19. But if I'd ever go in as a child, you know, there's not much to do. So eventually, after I messed around a bit, I'd go, I'd help the people, like, cut bygles or butter them and I might pick up the broom and walk around and sweep not that I was told to it's just something to do and you know I saw others doing it so I was like oh I'll help you you know and, and everyone was so friendly and it was just a nice place to be. Beigels I was reading it actually originated from Jewish communities in Poland isn't it? Yeah correct. What's the history behind it? So apparently there's a story that it was like there were hard times and there was a king and they just come out of some kind of bad situation and they wanted to celebrate. But they, because there were hard times, there wasn't like a lot of food and products and stuff to have a party with. So they had to make do with what they had. So apparently the bagel started by they didn't have enough to portion out for all the people around. So they used a bit less and they like they removed a bit, hence the hole. Yeah, it's a fun, it's a nice story. I, I don't know if that's the reason. So they made the whole and that way they could make an extra portion. So like, you know, you'd save a quarter from each one, you can make an, you know, an extra portion and they spread it out that way. That was another thing. Another story I heard was it was the way of carrying them and displaying them. So they'd put them onto sticks or string. Yeah. And instead of filling up bags and stuff, it's just an easy way to transport them. Right. So you just fill up a load of string with bicycles and you go around and you just take them off and sell them. So I think that's the shape that it came from. Why we boil them and the method of cooking them, I think that's probably something that evolved over time. And wasn't it, it used to be given to women following childbirth? I've never heard that. <laughs> I don't know. Potentially. Yeah. I know the pronunciation, a lot of people say bagel and we'd say yeah. bagel. That's because the Yiddish, which is an Eastern European Jewish language, words are pronounced differently in different languages, right? So you'd say bagel. Mm. And it would be the Yiddish pronunciation. My dad's from Israel. So he would also have a bit of an accent to him. So he'd said Bible. So hence why it's spelt and we say it that way. And then you know how English words sound slightly differently to American words? Yep. Bagel is a very American way to say it. Like you say, instead of we say Iraq, they say Iraq. You know, we say Arab, they say Arab. So yeah. it's like just they pronounce the word differently. I think that's all it is. But obviously there are more Americans in the world than us. So they say bagel took off a bit more, I guess. And I just want to talk about the area in which your shop is located. I guess it's in Brickling, which is quite historical. And I was reading up and apparently it was quite a derelict area before. Basically, it's um, throughout time, a lot of immigrants have waved into the UK when there have been problems, like people seeking asylum and whatnot. So the first wave, going back to that time, were, were the Jewish people. And they were brought into the East End because there's a dock there. London Docklands is not far from the East End. 
So they were brought into that area. Obviously, it's a poor area. So where do you put immigrants? Put them there. So that became a Jewish community and Jewish hub. And that's around the time that my dad came over here and he started his business, you know, the bakery. The next wave that came in were Bangladeshi people and whatnot. So at one point, it was a very Bangladeshi area, although a lot of Jewish people remained because some people bought shops and homes and, and houses and properties and obviously established shops. So some were made, some closed and moved on. And slowly, slowly, it turned into a bit of a Bangladeshi, Jewishy area. And now a lot of Spanish, Italian and French people came there. And over time, because it's so close to central London, it's become much more of an affluent area. And so you have a whole variety of different people. Like you've got Americans, English people have come back to the area. You've got lots of students. There's loads of nightlife and activities and things to do there. So now it's become a huge jumble of all different ethnicities. So it's really a nice, diverse interesting area to be yeah well we're, we're open all the time 24 hours a day every day we never shut we're always there we're reasonable in price my dad always believed in being fair and honest and not being greedy he was very content he said like i don't need much more the rest is just waste why should i kill myself and work extra and and squeeze everybody else around me when i'm happy so he said yeah, let everybody you know i'm doing well let everybody do well with me and he was, he was a really good guy. He was, he was a nice, not just because he's my dad. He actually like, he was a nice guy. Do you so, remember yeah. the story behind how the shop started in 1974? I mean, he started it with his brother, Amnon, and also Sammy as well, right? Or was that? Correct. Yeah. So it, prior to that, my uncle, Johnny, his elder brother was here many years before him. And he started the bagel trade. He was the person that brought bagels to England. He actually started it all over here. He had three shops and he recruited my dad to come over from Israel and help him. He put the seed in my dad's head and my dad said, well, there wasn't much going on in Israel, to be honest. It was a very poor country. It was like just started off at the time. And I was like, oh, I'll go, you know, I'll go. And he came, started working with him and he learned everything. And there's two bakeries on Brick Lane. Yeah. My uncle owned the other one. Yeah. And my dad worked there. Then my dad started renting that building off my uncle and started Bible Bake there really, but it was a wholesale business and a little bit of retail. And then my dad and my uncle had a bit of a falling out because my uncle wanted his shop back and my dad wanted to have a business there now, he wanted to keep going. Then the, the bakery where we are now was a butcher's. That guy retired and my dad knew him. So he took the shop, he offered to buy the shop from him and did. And that's why there were two bakeries there on Brick Lane in the same. And then my uncle sold that one to somebody else in the end. So now it's two different families. They actually all worked for my uncle Johnny. So it was all really the same, but it went that way after my uncle sold it. That's it. So really it's, that is kind of technically our shop, although we don't own it now. It's not us anymore, but that was us. And then we moved over here and somebody took over that one. I wouldn't say we're in competition. We're friendly. Everyone seems to like us more, thank God. And how did it go from being a wholesaler and having no shop run to actually selling to the public? So people used to come by, obviously could smell the produce or whatever. And although it was a factory and wholesale, like things were pretty relaxed back then, especially my dad is a very relaxed person. So the door would be open, people would come in, can I, can I use a toilet, can I this? We used to get deliveries from, um, you know, a lot of drivers, truck drivers would come by and drop deliveries off and stuff. And they'd ask to have some food and we'd give it to them. And then some say, oh no, I insist on paying. So, okay, but I don't know. And then passers-by could smell what was going on and say, oh, can I have some bagels? And yeah, yeah. And then eventually they just thought, well, let's just start selling some. So they started selling. People that passed by would ask. And there were lots of black cab drivers and road sweepers and people in the area that just knew us. Police, you know, working people that just got to know us from the community. They were like, oh, I'll buy some, I'll buy some, I'll buy some. And they were like, okay, let's make a small shop. So literally they just made a window because it was like all shutters and stuff. They just made a window, got a little box, literally like a little money box with some change in it. And people, they'll be working. People come and go, can I have some bagels? Okay, yeah, yeah. here's six bagels. And then one guy said like, oh, I want a sandwich. Like, you got anything to put in this? I'm hungry. I don't want to eat just bread. So I think one of them had something. They're like, hey, here, have some chicken or whatever, you know, whatever it was, you know. And then hmm, maybe we'll make sandwiches. So they started making sandwiches. And it wasn't even a shop at that time. It was just like literally a hole in the wall. And slowly, slowly, they started getting busy and busy. And people asking, asking. So they said, okay, people want this. Let's give it to them. So they made the shop. It was a tiny shop. There was literally like a tiny table. They would be cooking and then people would come in and then you'd go and serve and you'd carry on making bagels and you'd go and serve. And then and eventually it got too much for them to handle. They got a woman to come and make sandwiches and to serve. 
and it just grew. It just got bigger and bigger. And then as it got bigger, the shop got bigger. And the door opened up and we've got windows and it became what it is now. Almost by luck, you could say, by chance. Yeah. Just wow. And it sounds like it was purely by word of mouth. You didn't have to put yourself out there and advertise the newspapers. No, no. And I guess, thank God, we had a lot of like black cab drivers and mini cabs and stuff and road sweepers and things. And people would probably walk around and say, oh, where can you get something around here? Because like you said, it was a really rough and rubbish area. And then don't forget, you've got all the shops. It was like loads of um, seamstresses, tailors, leather factories, and everybody knew everybody in the area. They'd see you coming into your shop, going out of your shop, you'd park your car. You just get to know people in the roads. Like we still know all the shops around us, like on, on our section. I know every single shop owner. They all know us. I go to them to get stuff. They come to us to get stuff. And there was a lot of bartering here. Have a bagel, give me some soap. Have a bagel, can I have some onions, you know, and stuff like that. So just everybody started telling everybody and they would tell their customers and black cab drivers would be like, oh, I know a place you can go to. Come here and I'll, I'll get you a bagel. Come on, let's go and get a bagel if you're hungry, you know, and stuff like that. And just, yeah, just word of mouth. It just grew and grew and grew very yeah. slowly. And then all of a sudden, about the early 90s, I would say it started getting busier. Because up until then, like, we didn't have much money or anything. I, I used to share a room with my sister. You know, we lived in a small house, a small three-bedroom house. There were seven of us living there, you know. And it just, over time, you know, we got lucky. What do you think it was that it suddenly got busier in the 1990s? Was there a particular incident that happened? No, I don't think so. I think that was just, like, word of mouth started spreading. Like anything, one tells two people. Two people tell four people. Four becomes 16. 16 becomes... 85 you, can't, you get to a point where 100 people tells 300 people 300 a thousand you know and eventually it just goes out of control doesn't it like things on instagram how do things go viral one sense to one one sense to the other and you know so i wanted to talk a little bit about the fillings that you mentioned a bit what are the typical flavors i suppose salmon and cream cheese seems to be really really popular yeah my favorite the number one is the salmon and cream cheese another yeah. very famous offering a jewish offering is the salt beef mm-hmm that's the number one most popular product, hands down. Isn't there a story behind that, that your dad loved pastrami, which is salt beef, and yeah. used to buy it from yeah. someone else? That's yeah. right. My dad used to go to, there's a, there was a place called Blooms in Whitechapel, another Jewish shop. They're a delicatessen. They, <laughs> they sell like pickled cucumbers, herring, fish balls, latkes, salamis, you know, like bits and pieces, deli food. So there's a delicatessen, you can go in there, you can have a, some chicken soup, you can sit down and eat a meal or whatever, like traditional Jewish bits and pieces. And I just go all the time, like, I'm not going to live on bicycles, I used to go and eat. So he loved salt beef, they used to sell salt beef. And they got into trouble one day and closed down, they decided to leave the area. And my dad says, you know, you like salt beef. And I said, eh, let's start selling salt beef. So we bought some in, we started doing it, and... We bought one piece of meat, we sold it. We bought two pieces, we sold it. Da, da, da. Everyone started getting a taste for it. And they're like, now we're buying lots of beef. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you make it sound so easy. Like, do you guys figure out the recipe along the way? There's a standard. There's a traditional way of cooking it. You know, like I said, my dad was friendly with the guy. He probably asked him and he told him a little bit. And it's just a traditional Jewish food. Like a lot of households make it themselves. Especially back then, one out of five households would probably make their own salt beef. So it's not like it's a secret or anything, but then you go to everybody's house, everybody's mum will make it a bit different. It'll taste different, right? Some puts more pepper, some puts less pepper, some puts more of this, some, you know, like, so my dad's, he was not bad to cook, you know, he's quite a good cook. I guess he baked all his life, that's what he did. So he cooked the salt beef and then one, he ate it and he said, mm, it needs more this, you know, mm, it needs more that. He liked it and... Others also liked it. I don't know what to say. He, you know, he had a good tongue. <laughs> he had a good palate. He knew what he was doing. So, yeah. Your father sounds like such an interesting person. Are there particular memories that stand out for you? You know, he'd, he'd done a lot in his life. From a very young age, he was one of eight children. His dad and mum, like, I don't think they were like 100%. His dad wasn't around all the time. He used to go off and come back and go off and come back. And they didn't have a great relationship. He was one of the older children. He was apparently very difficult to discipline. So uh, yeah, he was like a bit of a rebel, you know, he wasn't, wasn't he loved his mom to bits. Like as soon as she told him something, he'll do it. But he was also like, he liked to do his own thing. He liked to push the boundaries, you know? So apparently at one point he went to um, kind of like a boarding school for like naughty children, you could say, you know, he was a naughty. He used to go off and not come back for a few days and 
God knows what else. And so he went to school for naughty children, which so was a bit difficult. So he like, you know, he's got lots of stories of things that he had done. You know, he he's got up to mischief. He, he was always doing something. Then his parents were carpenters. Traditionally, my grandfather was a carpenter. My dad used to do that. He was a, used to do French polishing, and so he's, he's he was very handy. He knew how to fix everything. Cause he, he was like pretty hands-on. It was in the army. He was in, you know, have you ever heard of the War of Independence? Like the five-day war of Israel? No. So after um, Israel used to be under British rule, it was called Palestine at that point. So after the World War, everybody voted and gave Israel to the Jewish people. There was a little bit of like harmony at the time because there were just Middle Eastern Jews and all the Arabs and, and Palestinians and whatnot living there. Afterwards, the East European Jews came in from after World War II because that's where they settled. They, they made that their home. And um, I think there's a little bit of rivalry. And I don't think the Palestinians really appreciated that the country kind I don't know whose country it was. It was the British. The British owned Israel. But I guess they would say we, we were here first. But then you've also got the native Jews who were there first. So it's, I'm not a politician. But anyway, because of all of that, the war started. The native Arabs or Muslims or, or not Jewish or whatever people didn't appreciate the newcomers and wanted to get rid of them and whatever. Didn't accept what the world voted. Like, how can you just give away a country? It's our country. We live here. Or whatever. Anyway, so my dad was in that war, which is, I guess, quite interesting. He'd done a lot of different jobs and things. You know, he'd, he'd, he'd done a lot in his life. And back then, like, things were hard. So you just had to get by and do what you can to get by. Memories of him? He was a very funny character. He had a really, really good personality. He was like, it's strange. Like, he'd blow up over little things. Like if I um, was making too much noise or woke him up or whatever, like, I, you know, I'd get in huge trouble. And I had the car accident. I was sort of, oh my God, he's going to go crazy. I'm dead, I'm dead. So he said, hmm, okay. Then he asked me, so what did you do? So I said, well, I had some money on him. So I gave the guy some money and I said, I'll fix the car privately. I really, I kind of didn't want you to find out, but I didn't have enough money. So I owe him more. So I was like, okay, very good. No problem. <laughs> and I was like, really? No problem? What are you talking about? <laughs> you know, I thought I was going to have my head cut off. <laughs> but no, no problem. I spilled my cup of coffee on the floor. Oh my God, oh my God, what have you done? I was like, why? <laughs> it's just funny. You kept you on your toes, you know? It's always, it surprised me. What else do I remember? He would always make you laugh. Yeah, it was funny. He's like, for example, he, he kept himself to himself a lot of the time. He was like quiet. But then like, he'd want a bit of um, company. So he'd normally like, he had his own living room where he'd watch TV and stuff. And say I had loads of friends over because we were quite social. We had, our house was like, we had an open door. Anyone, all my friends, my brothers and sisters' friends, I was one of five. So it was quite often a lot of people in my house. And every so often he'd come in and he'd be like sitting with us and be like, oh, how's it going, everyone? You okay? Uh, you know, yeah. And then he'd be talking with us. And then all of a sudden he'd get fed up. So he'd be like, okay, and just walk away. <laughs> like, I've said hello. Bye. I'm gone. You know, it's, it's funny. It was like when things were on his terms. It was quite funny the way he did it. I just remember he was a really, really good dad. He was a good, nice guy. I don't know. Do you feel as though because you had seen your father put so much into this shop that you had to join it? No, definitely. Like he was really, really hugely committed. I told people it was his first wife. There was the bakery and then there was us. <laughs> but not in a bad way, but like I can understand, you know, how much of himself he put into the place to make it what it is. You know, it's part of you. It could be your first wife or your first child or whatever, you know. And plus it's, we were lived off it, right? It was keeping us going. Yeah. So it's an important place as well. But also there's like a character then Atom. So there's part of it, like you could say there's still part of him there, if that makes sense. No, I'm not being like all spiritual and, and, and all that. Yeah. But what I mean is like the way he was, like the characteristics and the way he, he set the standard there, you know, it's like his personality is like, you can feel it. You know, there's atmosphere because he, he was a bit quirky. He wasn't boring. For example, you know, most people, you've got a shop full of people. You wouldn't think of raising your voice or um, yeah. saying what's on your mind or, you know, yeah. you're like, there was no filter. If you thought it, it came out. You know, he didn't think, should I say this or shouldn't I say this? I feel this way and I'm going to tell you I feel this way. No, I'm not happy. Hey, you're an idiot. <laughs> like, as blunt as that. Not, I don't think you should have done that. Hey, you idiot, what have you done? <laughs> you know. It doesn't sound very English for sure. <laughs> it's not English at all. <laughs> My dad is not English at all. I'm 50-50. I've got, you know, every so often it comes out, but most of the time it's, it's in. It's also like it kind of attracts the similar kind of customers as well. I read this story about apparently you used to not sell bagels in the evening and a customer came was so upset. He came the next morning, banged on the table and he broke the till. 
Is that a true story? No. So <laughs> basically why we started doing sandwiches, this was like back in the day when I said they had a little lockbox and stuff. And they didn't do it all the time. Like I said, it was just people would ask and they're like, okay, we have some, here you go. You know, fine. One guy came in who was drunk. He was a regular. He was wasn't working on that evening, but normally he was like something. He was an English guy. And he came in and he was drunk and he wanted to eat. He was really hungry. So my dad said, well, we don't do that all the time. Like we don't have today. Oh, bang, what are you talking about? I'm hungry. The guy was upset. So my dad said, hmm, okay, we do every day now. <laughs> Uh, but it's, it's a funny his character like most people would be like you know get upset like who are you to tell me what to do this is my shop he was like wow okay every day <laughs> come tomorrow i promise you know i think he taught me a very good attitude and way to look at things like the guy is feeling something he's feeling angry for a reason there's no point in getting angry with him just like think he just thought outside the box like he's angry because i'm not providing something for him that I could make money off. Hmm. Okay, I'll give it to you. <laughs> Makes so sense that... really, doesn't it? It's quite logical. But not everyone thinks that way. Most people think emotionally and would be like, why are you angry with me? I, that, yeah, that's definitely like something that stuck with me. It's very clever. So I try and look at things that way more. Are you always receptive to this kind of thing? So if I went in and just made a big fuss and say, hey, you should sell this as well. <laughs> you just implement into the recipe that I had. I would think, I would consider it. Like if yeah. it was, look, one person out of a thousand, well, yeah. no, that's the rest of my time. Not in a rude way, but like to do all of that effort for one person, just to keep one person happy. Like I don't mind doing a favor, but every day, all my life, that's a bit of a burden. But if a lot of people asked, like we didn't always do gherkins in the salt beef. Now it's like, God forbid you sell good beef without gherkins, like were you mad, but we didn't. And more and more people saying, you should, you should, you should, you should, you should, you should. Okay, we will. We did. Listen yeah. to people. And they're your regulars as well. Yeah. What is it like to run a family run business? I mean, there's no segregation between personal and professional life. Are there rules? Like, do you say if you are upset at home, don't bring it to work? Uh, no, my, no the, like I said, my dad was unique. Um, <laughs> and and my, not just my dad, my uncles, my family generally, they're like, you know, it's, maybe it's an, an Israeli thing. Like, yeah, to an extent, there's obviously a line there. But we know each other. We grew up together. It's not like we don't know each other. So my uncle will come in in the mood and complain about everything. And I'll just be like, he's in the mood today. doesn't matter what you tell him. It's not good. He's in the mood. Okay, he's in the mood. If it goes on for days and days and days and it starts to get too much, I say to him, hey, enough now. Calm down. Like, you've hit the point. Stop. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, sorry, all right. You know, he'll snap out of it. But you also allow him, and plus he's older than me, I respect him. My brother and I are like, you could say, like this. Like, I know I upset him sometimes, I see it on his face, but I'm the older brother, so he's like a bit... I don't know if you have it in your culture, but in our culture, I, I, to be honest, I wouldn't care if he turned around and told me, get lost, you know, I, I don't care. I'm pretty relaxed. But he's got that built-in respect, it's like natural within us. So I see his face and I think to myself, ah, I've done something. He won't tell me what, I won't have to apologise. But I look at him and say, look, what is it? They'll say, hmm, nothing, nothing, nothing. And I'd be like, all right, all right, I'll, I've done something. All right, I'm sorry. All right, whatever it is, it's stop. I'll go, I'll leave him. I'll go away. But we know each other. It's not a problem. Business is life. Life is business now. It's all one. What was it like when you became managing director that you feel as though you had to steer the business in a certain direction? I became a lot more serious, simply because of more responsibility. Now... When I was just working for my dad, it's like there were certain things I didn't have to worry about, you know, how much the gas costs, if so-and-so is going to turn up for work or not, if the health inspector turns up and there are new rules now, you need to start doing this. You know, I, just, I didn't really have to worry about any of that so much. I had less responsibility. So I guess I became a slightly more serious, although I don't know if you can tell I'm not that serious. You know, I, I am when I have to be, I guess. Also, like... I came in at a young age. I started working there at 19. A lot of our staff have been with us for years and years. I've known them since I was small. So imagine being a, at the time a 19 year old. I was manager there, not managing director. But imagine having to tell people that 50 years old, people that could be my father or my uncle, what to do. Not easy. So I yeah. found my way, but it was a long road, a long way to El Dorado, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I've heard a lot of this as well, like lots of friends who would then take over their family business. but. They have employees who have been there since they were babies or before they were even born. And how do you gain Thank their respect? Much. They know it better than you. 
Well, actually, funnily enough, I've learned everything. I came in and I think my dad was very wise. I came in emptying bin bags, cleaning the toilets, sweeping and mopping, you know, all the muck that the others were well, more senior people than me wouldn't want to do. I was doing it. And you know what? I did it with a smile. I got it. It makes complete sense. If I ever saw anyone that needs, even now, like it's just the way I, I was brought up. I'm their boss. If I see somebody doing something, I'll run over to help them. If I see someone struggling, I'm there. No problem. I'm very hands-on. Even the funny that I was, it's really nice to hear. A lot of customers have said like, you don't stop. You do everything. Like some guy says to me, I really respect you. You're the boss. You could be standing there watching people and you're like cleaning and mopping the floors and washing the walls down and whatever. And I was like, you know, it needs to be done. And we're all human beings. You know, it's one thing my dad told me, we're all human. It doesn't matter. I'm your boss. I'm not your boss. And this is not, there's no such, you know, all this hierarchy, kings and queens and we're all human beings. You know, there's no, there's no, no reason why I'm best. I, I'm not allowed to clean toilets and you are. We, we can all do it. I'm guessing you've been to other bagel places. They don't all taste the same. Yeah. Believe me, they've all got the same stuff inside them. It's how you do it and what you know here. And it's, it's not just um, a recipe you can learn in a book. Or, or, or I think bread is not something you, it, you have to understand what's going on. It's the touch and the feel. There's timing. At the same time, I'm not going to turn around and do it and let someone watch me and never touch it. Hi, hey, it's your turn too. <laughs> Let's share. <laughs> That's true. I, I remember like going to visit two weeks ago and I saw that you were there. You were just helping to put all the bagels together. And I thought, oh, everyone's, sure? yeah, I saw, I saw you were there, but then I thought there's like a very, very long line behind me. I better not stop and ask you anything. Sorry. You always, care about Look, it. always come over and say hi. There's no problem. Oh, that's brilliant. I mean, I noticed that you also released your iconic bagel recipe. Was there a reason behind that? There's more to it than just a list of ingredients. Mm. Everybody's, but like, I, I've, I've looked and I've been to other bakeries and stuff. Every batch of flour is different. And then throughout the year, the temperature of the water and, and the atmosphere is different. And that all affects humidity levels in the road. It all affects it. So it's like, I can give you the recipe. I can write it down to you. You can even watch me do it once. You'll never do it the same. Was there a reason so, yeah. that pushed you to releasing that recipe? Was it because many people were asking you, you thought, whatever, I'll just release yeah, it? Yeah, I was just asked. I was asked many, many, many times. And to be honest, okay, why not? You want to hear? Yeah. yeah. If, if, look, if you can copy, good luck to you. Go ahead. Why not? Brilliant. Just don't do it next to me. <laughs> <laughs> don't open a shop like, opposite for me. <laughs> yeah, like, just don't do it next to me, please. <laughs> I helped you, huh? <laughs> you <know that. laughs> yeah. Do you ever think about opening another branch? Yeah, yes. I mean, look, like I said, my dad was content. But my dad brought me into life up here. I don't want to drop down. I lost the game of life and I've also disrespected him. Like, uh, uh, you know, so please, God, whoop. You know, that's the the hope. At least, at least to stay on the same level, right? I don't think. <laughs> um, but yeah, like there's lots of demand out there. Not just that. Thank God they fed three families. There were three owners. They fed and looked after very well three families. So much so that I'm even in a position where my children are in a quite comfortable position. But how many times can you cut a cake? I've got three kids. My brother's gonna have some kids. My cousin's gonna have some kids. They're gonna have kids. I'm not saying that my whole family forever and ever are going to be in the bakery business, but it'd be nice to grow it a little bit. Plus, like, I love it. And lots of people, you know, it's, it would be nice to see it shine. I love the place. It's part of me. I grew up, I might as well be called Daniel Bagel Bake Cohen. Obviously, this is something that's impact everyone, the pandemic. When did you first hear about it and how they impact what you guys were doing? I'll be honest. Like I said, we think outside the box. When I first yeah. heard about it and everything, I was like, Ah, how bad could it be? <laughs> you know, then I started to take it a little bit seriously. I, I found it odd that you were hearing reports from all different countries, yet the airports were wide open. Like, hello, there's something going around killing people. Yeah, yeah, come, come. Just stamp your passport and come in. Were you stupid or what? You know, stop the planes. But anyway, they didn't. It came here. At the very beginning, like, our doors have never been shut. We didn't have a key to the door. Yeah. I found myself looking into getting shutters. Because it's a bit of a rough area, even though it's cleaned up, it's still a bit of a rough area. You know, people know we're busy and probably assume there's something there to take. It just takes a brick to smash our windows. And so we were looking at shutters, we were manning the shop in the evenings. And then all of a sudden, furlough scheme came in, you know, and everyone's scared. I don't want to die. And there's furlough available. I don't want to work. I don't want to work. I've got kids. I was like, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, you, look, if you don't want to work and you're scared, 
don't work. Well, can I tell you, I'm not going to force you. When you want to come back, we're here. A lot of people stopped working and left. You know, it was like there was a handful of people that were willing to stay and wanted to stay and who were like, for whatever reason, you know, they didn't want to stay at home. You know, obviously it's more money than furlough, so they didn't want to lose their money or whatever. And, and plus they just, they wanted to help us out as well. We've got a very good relationship with our staff. Like I said, I've known some of them since I was born. Although they work for us, I call them an extension of my family. We're like, it's a family business, including them. In some way, they're like part of my family, you know? And thank God some of them feel the same way too. It's not one way, which is nice. You know, we've got a good relationship. So anyway, a few people stayed. Me and my brother and my uncle and my cousin, like plus one or two others, like I said, like we basically man the shop 24 hours every day, like, <laughs> you know, in sh- like dotted around the place. Like, I worked a lot recently. <laughs> Whatever, you know, it's what you have to do. It's part and parcel, right? And yeah, that's, that's how we coped. And then um, you hear a story like, although we've got a good name, we un- we're on the understanding that nothing's invulnerable. Everything's fragile. You could be Arnold Schwarzenegger and drop down dead tomorrow, you know? So, um, yeah, we were worried. Don't, don't get me wrong, we were worried. And plus, it's like, imagine like being used to seeing a queue of people in your shop every day, smiling and laughing and saying, we love you. And then all of a sudden not even seeing a fly coming through your door. It's hard. And then you've got bills. The bills don't stop. Nothing stops, you know. You've still got those expenses on top of you. And it's, I can't just turn around and say, oh, I want furlough. I'm self-employed. I'm independent here. You're on your own. So, okay. The first few weeks, literally, like, ghost town. Maybe one or two or three people. You know, there's always one or two people around. Everyone assumed we were closed, apparently. People were phoning up the shop saying, like, are you closed? Are you closed? Are you closed? Because the rules were only food shops and, and essentials thank god we're an essential which is lucky i guess because it's been food <laughs> you need it to live so um people finally started catching wind that we were open and to be fair we weren't doing loads but for three or four people it was a lot we were working we were, you know <laughs> we were working all of us had to do every job going under the sun you you not believe so yeah i mean we just kept at it kept our fingers crossed and thank God, like, we're still here, you know, and almost back to normal. Well, I, I lie. We're not back to normal. I don't think we'll ever get back to normal, but we're here, you know. I'm going to lie either. I'm going to turn and say, oh, take you for an idiot. We're poor. I'm not poor. So, yeah, we give. We give all the time. Whoever asks, 99% of the time we give. Some people come in and are a bit cheeky. I might say, like, you know, I want your finger because, you know, you've got another four. Well, no, that's not, I need all five, <laughs> you know. But if you want something, I'll give you. Yeah, 100%. We give a lot of people. Um, there's a school. They come in every other day. We give them bagels and bread for the school to have like a tea. or You know, I know some schools do like a snack at a break time or whatever. Here's your snack. Nearly every week they come. Um, there's a local church. They do like some gathering. I don't know, some kind of alcohol anonymous meeting. or I, I don't know what it is they're doing. They're doing something. Okay, here's for some food. Another school got in touch with us. The member of the PTA, they want to do fundraising for schools. You know, a lot of schools are having... The government's not giving people enough money around here. So, okay, have some stuff to sell at your PTA, no problem. You know, we give. We're no problem. You know, we're not greedy. 